couple of weeks later, or it might have been a week later or something, but I got a phone call when I was at work, and it was the doctors. It was someone on the phone, and to this day I don't know who it was. I can only assume it wasn't a doctor or a nurse, because the person didn't seem to have much medical knowledge at all. But by this point, it's 2018, I got my phone out to Google what is azoospermia to find out that that meant I had zero sperm, which was just mad. All the classic stages of grief, like denial, blame, anger, depression, I was going through that. And not knowingly, I was being dragged through it, being angry for uh, no apparent reason. Identify problem, fix problem. And when you can't fix it, you just start to feel helpless. And that's exactly where I was. That that really compounded the, the, the shame that I was already feeling, but the stigma as well. I said, if you want to go, go to find, find some other bloke who can give you what you want, then I will not hold you back. Welcome back to the Not Quite Pod. Today we've got Sean with us. Sean, do you just quickly want to introduce yourself and let everyone know a bit about yourself? Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, so my name's Sean, or as I'm more commonly becoming known as these days, Knackered Knackers, which is uh, quite the uh, the mantle, but I've only got myself to blame because I came up with it. I am a male fertility advocate um, first and foremost, uh, but also a male fertility coach, uh, which I, I, I do that after going through infertility myself and essentially coming out the other side as a better version of myself. Amazing. I'm really looking forward to this. So the first thing I wanted to ask is what what started you on this journey of educating more people about male fertility? So to avoid taking up your whole pod, I'll, I will condense many years of pain in, in, in as short, short a time as I can. But essentially, in 2017, my wife and I at that point had been married four years. We'd been together about eight. After getting married, we didn't, we made the conscious decision not to just jump in to try and for children, even though society expects us, expected us to, and even everyone, friends and family, oh, so you're married? When, when are you going to have kids? Now, that, that question annoyed us already even before we had started trying um because it's like well we want to we've just got married let's just enjoy being husband and wife for a bit which we did and we we had some fantastic times did a bit of traveling and stuff but then we, we thought right now is time let's just let's start trying for kids and so at first she came off the contraceptive pill and we were just kind of thinking it's going to happen easily and naturally it's what happens right it's, you just come off the pill and Hey presto! Uh, nine months later, the, the screaming in, in a uh, maternity ward. But those months went on and on and on. The sex started becoming more pressured, more on demand, more functional. And uh, so, toward, after about a year, we went to the doctor. Now it's weird to say this because we didn't have any inkling that anything would be wrong, but also. I, I had mumps when I was 22 and the crucial part of that is that it's post-puberty and the mumps I had my, it caused my balls to swell up like massive and that what that can do and what it did do in my case is, is damage your um, my, my sperm production and um, but I always had that in the back of my mind but never considered it be a problem because I was 22 in 2005 as before we all had iPhones and a world of knowledge in our pocket I didn't really know about the implications that it could have. I wasn't warned about it from my doctors because I'd been going when I was ill with the mumps. It was probably the most ill I've ever been for three weeks. And um, so I just had no reason to think it was going to happen. But then as as the years went on and I started hearing little bits here and there that it can have an impact, I still ne never even gave it a passing thought because I just assume it's all going to be easy and good. So we went to the doctors and we said, oh, by the way, I did have this. Um, so he, he sent us both off for tests uh, towards the end of 2017. I went to, to go and give a, a sperm sample. And uh, a couple of weeks later, or it might have been a week later or something, but I got a phone call when I was at work and it was the doctors. Uh, and, and it was someone on the phone. And to this day, I don't know who it was. I can only assume it wasn't a doctor or a nurse because the person didn't seem to have much medical knowledge at all she was essentially just asking me to come back in for a further test three months down the line so i was like why is that then and she was like oh it just says here that you need to book in a, another test 
and again, what I know now is that the sperm cycle regenerates after three months, between 75, 76 days and 90 days. I didn't know that, wasn't explained to me, but I was like, okay, so, so right, okay, I'll do that. She says, yeah, it says here that you've got, and then she stumbled over the word azoospermia. Uh, kind of said, uh, he says that you've got azu, azu, azuspermia. Um, and she clearly hadn't proofread the letter through. So I said, what, what's that? And she said, I don't know. I said, okay, fine. Got off the phone, booked the appointment, and then got off the phone. Got uh, By this point, it's 2018. It was, I think it was January 18. I um, got my phone out to Google what is azuspermia to find out that that meant I had zero sperm, which was just mad, right? life-changing i just went into a, a form of shock um because you know that the kind of the perception is that men don't have fertility issues that we have tens of millions of sperm in each ejaculate and I, i'm being told I've, I've got zero so i phoned my wife relayed the news to her and she was like yeah. well should we do you want to come home like we should go home like and i was like no 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 fine i'll go back to work i'll see you at home later which like classic shock really and that kind of sets the tone mm. for the next year and a half really is because that second test confirmed it i had nothing there and the ne- it was like being thrown into a river and that river is like kind of the fertility struggle world it's, it's this whole new world where you're learning all of these new words new scientific terms new learning new doctors and names and roles and and disciplines you're getting referred left right and center and that river can be fast flowing it can be dragging you under and you can feel like you're drowning and you're gasping for air then there are other times where it's like really slow and nothing seems to be happening you're just bobbing there and you, you want progress you want to be going further down the line but you're doing nothing and like that nothing that that wading treacle almost was a lot of that was navigating the nhs trying to get referrals and funding for for uh, fertility treatment and um kind of fast forward to 2019 uh, and i had the first of two operations like obviously the the aim was for the first one to to if that had worked it was relatively minor it's called a varicocele embolization because it was established that i had a varicocele above my testicles which essentially is a really large cluster of veins um very common very common in men um but in subfertile men. So varicoceles are around 12.5% of men have them in general. Um, but in subfertile men, it accounts for around 40, 45% of cases. It's a big cluster of veins above the balls. Now, the reason the balls hang below the, like the body is to keep them cooler, about two degrees cooler than body temperature. That's what sperm need is a cooler environment. But those big veins can overheat the, the testicles overheat the sperm and damage production. So many men have these without knowing. They just kind of think that that dull ache in in their balls is is normal. Some people don't have an ache. I didn't have one. I didn't know I had it. But the first few urologists, which is one of the specialist doctors that got hands on, found it straight away. So I had that operation. Didn't work. And I then so then in that was March nineteen. Uh, in August 19, I then had a micro TZ, which is where essentially it's it's the last chance saloon. It was the nuclear solution. I had my balls cut open um, and to look for sperm directly from source. And um, yeah. Now, the thing is with, like I've kind of already said, with, with fertility treatment, there's a lot of waiting. Um, and after the varicocele embolization, I had mm-hmm. to wait three months for the sperm cycle to regenerate just because that was going to be the way of seeing if it worked to see if three months down the line whether the production had kind of been aided in any way was there now going to be something or but no there was that three month wait was was awful and it was a, a no and that was probably actually our lowest point but with the micro tz going under general anesthetic and having my balls cut open I received the results immediately after. As soon as I woke up, the surgeon and nurse were there and it was a no, there's nothing there. Um, and that that took four weeks of healing, both mentally, physically and emotionally. Uh, five days of not being able to walk at all, really. Like, and then after that, waddling for about another week, like John Wayne and uh, yeah, a lot of healing. And 
a lot of soul searching, but I'd already that had already been happening before since the initial diagnosis. Essentially, you get mm. you essentially start going to grief without knowing it. Um, it's this weird, really weird kind of disenfranchised grief because we often associate grief with the loss of a loved one or a friend or a pet or something that we have memories and photos of and, and things to cling on to. But I have, I was losing this, firstly, the vision of, of what I assumed parenthood would be and how it would look. But also I was losing my ability to pass on my genetics to father a biological child. And all the classic stages of grief, like the denial, blame, anger, depression, I was going through that. And not knowingly, I was being dragged through it, being angry for uh, no apparent reason, but, you know, in hindsight, realising why. And that took a lot of kind of overcoming that last stop. And um, once I did start healing, and, and you know, as I said, this, is, this has been going on, a lot of soul searching and stuff, but I decided that I wanted to be a father no matter what it took, that I had a lot more to give than just passing on my DNA as a man, as a father. So we decided to pursue our dream of becoming parents by using donor sperm. And uh, we kind of started our, our fertility treatment to use the donor sperm at the end of 2019. Um, but then my wife got seriously poorly from it, so we had to stop for an indeterminate amount of time. Um, uh, we were ready to go again in March 2020. Then lockdown happened, and so all the clinics shut. And like literally like two days before we were due to start. And uh, then they reopened in May 2020 and we were ready to go. We were just happened to be at the right stage of my wife's um, uh, monthly cycle that we could get going almost immediately. And we went forward. Uh, she had the embryo transfer and it worked. It was positive for us. Um, and in February 21, we were blessed with our beautiful twins Ray and Evelyn so there's four years of pain in 11 and a half minutes <laughs> bloody hell I mean first of all what a what a what a great ending though you go through all this battling and end up with uh, I mean in some ways it probably was hell when they were little but coming out with twins that that must have felt quite almost ironic I would have felt if to be honest it was like oh we've struggled this much it's like the whole saying as they say they can, it's like yeah. buses yeah. <laughs> wait ages for one and then two come along at once we had we had um two embryos transferred so it, we knew that the, the chances of having twins was increased and uh, yeah thankfully for us it, they, they both decided to hang around um, i want if it's okay i want to sort of dive into uh, the mental health side of things. Obviously, you, you briefly touched on there your sort of journey through it and said that you battled a lot with your mental health through the whole journey. What was that like? Obviously, I'd imagine at the beginning when you started to notice that you were struggling with your mental health, I'd imagine you went into that uh, state where a lot of men go into, oh, it'll be fine. I'm just going to suck it up and get on with it. And then obviously you start realising that it's not working and you need to look at other people and look for support what was that journey like going from i can handle this on my own to then reaching out and essentially doing what you're doing now because your whole page is dedicated to supporting men through a similar journey what what has that journey been like like what has the different stages of it been like was that it was kind of the opposite way around to, to how you asked the question it was at first i was like well, I, no, I'd say actually, no. At first, I went into complete denial. I was like, no, this ain't, this isn't happening. Um, and that's, again, part of grief. Um, but then, yeah, one of the first things I did once I started getting past that is looking for support and to, like, kind of looking around the internet for a bit of um, information. And what I was seeing, or, or more importantly, what I wasn't seeing was any other men talking about this. And there was nothing like no support groups, no advocates, no, just nothing. No doctors even talking about male infertility. Everything I could find was about female infertility or female led support groups or, or female advocates talking about it. And I was like, so that, that really then, and that's what I say about the opposite. Cause I, I was probably open to that initially and 
uh, whether I was going to engage with it at first, I don't know. I, don't, I probably don't know myself, but what I was looking for is is to know that I wasn't mm. alone. But then that that voice wasn't out there, so it just compounded the feeling that oh shit, this is just me. This I'm the only person that this is happening to. The only yeah. bloke. So um, that that really compounded the, the the shame that I was already feeling, but the stigma as well, because as men, like we are often our masculinity is wrapped up in our virility. How many kids can you have and how, like, you know, how, how easy it is for you to knock up women and stuff. And, and, you know, sex education at school is all about how not to get pregnant. And you have the fear of getting, even getting naked near your first few girlfriends thinking, Oh God, like I could knock them up. And actually none of it is about, the actual wide scale problem that, that especially, uh, well, no, no, I was going to say Western society, but because there is a lot that, that's impacting us more, but no, around the world, the, the World Health Organization have said that literally indiscriminately infertility is affecting one in six people worldwide. And that's indiscriminate of race, background, financial circumstances, anything. So, but where's the men talking about this? If there's that many people and, yeah, I went into a hole. I went into a deep hole. I was struggling. My my ego w- was under serious attack of like who I was as a man. If I couldn't procreate, then what does that make me? Like, surely that's our job. Like, that's what you know, the kind of yeah. what society portrays is. Oh, yeah. our job is to provide, to protect, and to procreate. And it's just absolute. You know, I could say down the line, it's absolute bullshit. But when you're in it and, and your ego is being attacked and your identity as a man is being yeah. really stripped away from you, I went into a hole and I was not talking and I wasn't dealing with it. And interestingly, and this this was like a, a moment of realisation for me, not at the time, but two and a half years on after starting to share my story, two and a half years of sharing my story, so summer 2023 so I, I i started putting myself out there january 21 a month before my kids were born because i was like i decided i wanted to be what i needed and i was like I, i'm gonna be the voice that other men need and i was often talking about what i've explained oh yeah you go through grief the classic stages there's five classic stages in no particular order well the, the, the one comes always comes last which is acceptance but the others can you can kind of flip-flop between Blame, anger, denial, depression. And for two and a half years, I was going, yes, yeah. so I was going through all this, the anger, I remember that. But depression, no, I didn't really have that. And and I was like, it's weird because I'm literally telling as many people as will listen and as many people as come across my stuff that I'm a man, I have no sperm, I'm infertile. But there was obviously some, <laughs> some residual ego there to not admit that I was depressed. And it it was when I read the, de- yeah. the the definition of depression that I was like, holy shit, yeah, I had that. And it is something, and it literally is, and this isn't verbatim, but it's along the lines of a sustained period of low mood where you're not doing the usual things that bring you joy. And I was like, oh God, yeah, I was in that for like two years. It's crazy because I think as well, a lot of people see depression as this one size fits all thing. And like, that it's such a volatile affects people in multiple different ways so it it makes complete sense that unless you know to look for it it's like the other thing is i've had a lot of battles with anxiety and because you've been through it you can see it in other people on your guide okay you're 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 heading to the red line and we need to pull you back from that red line because it's not a good thing and it's a similar thing once you've realized you've experienced it you can see it in others because you see commonalities of it but um what were the conversations like with your partner like obviously you said that you weren't very talkative through the journey but i can imagine there were certain conversations you had with your partner what was that like because it can feel very difficult i would imagine because you feel like you've taken on a lot of responsibility of like almost your this is going to sound really blunt but you're the problem and it's like, okay, how do I fix this? Because I think a lot of men's instincts is, okay, fix. But how how do we fix this? Um, yeah, what were some of those conversations like? Um, you absolutely hit the nail on the head. That is men, isn't it? It's, it? Right, identify problem, fix problem. 
And when you can't fix it, you just start to feel helpless. And that's exactly where I was. And yeah, I wasn't particularly opening up to my wife at first. And, and to come back on your point about depression, and she doesn't mind me talking about this. She had suffered with it and anxiety for years, um, even before we went through this. And then this just compounded things for her. But having seen it from the outside in, I was only having her as the comparison to draw on because obviously everyone else, unless they're telling you, people just live their lives and, and they have unknown suffering. But with my wife, it was something that I knew and I was living with. And I was assuming that that is what it is for everyone. But like you said, we're all different. And it's just when that, that black fog is there and it affects everyone differently and, and realising that, yeah, I wasn't the kind of effervescent self that I usually was for a long time and yeah and uh, you know and again we, we stigmatize f mental health where you're like you think it's you've only got it if you're kind of clinically depressed and you're taking pills and all this but no it's, it's a massive range but yeah I um yeah my wife she was brilliant she because she'd been on that journey through kind of her own mental health she she knew the answers and or at least knew like what some good starting places to 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 try and but and and she was really you know of course she loved and cared for me she was trying to push me to do the things that she knew would help but that pushing was just pushing me further down and further in and more reluctant to speak and and she picked yeah. up on that which was great and, and she started to lay off and and give me time and space but kind of there there is a limitation to that because also sometimes you do need to just hurry up because things are happening with the fertility and like you need to like go to this appointment or make this decision. So there are times where yeah, you, you do need a good push because it's like, right, this is happening now. What, what are we doing? But yeah, I mean, I was at appointments f for a long period where I was in the room physically, but not mentally. And I was having to come out of appointments and, and ask yeah. her what had been said and having to get a debrief from her. I mean, that's really interesting because I, uh, that's something I think a lot of people struggle with. If you're in that mindset, you you do, you just dissociate and you're you're off in your own thoughts. And, and yeah, as you say, going through that journey for something that's a medical procedure or a medical support thing, it's it's kind of reassuring that some someone's there to kind of go no this was said this was said and you missed this bit but it it must be so daunting because I even have it when I do it in conversations where you clock out and then you clock back in and you're like oh my god I need to be listening I can imagine that in that situation of such a volatile scenario of like this is a big big thing that must have also then scared scared you further. I would have imagined. Mm. Yeah. You go through, you go to these like appointment after appointment and you're just being told bad news every time, like life changing news. And, and yeah, you just mentally check out and, and fertility treatment, fertility struggles are, are for me, one of the only medical situations I can think of where you are actually in it as a partnership. And of course there are some exceptions to that where people pursue single parenthood by choice, but by and large, there's a couple, and they're in it together. Whereas, you know, for other medical appointments, you may ask for someone to come along with you for support, but this is one of the things where you're there together. And and that is something that I really had to change my perspective on because you, you mentioned earlier about like kind of guilt and blame. I, I was going for a tremendous amount of both because I was putting her through this as well, but actually flipping that and realising that we're in it together. And, and that's why... But, you know, there were points, and I've said this, and this is echoed throughout so many men I speak to. I said, if you want to go, go to find find some other bloke who can give you what you want, then I will not hold you back. And and, I, and she, she she said, don't talk shit. Like, I got with you for you. I didn't. We didn't know about this. I didn't look you up and down and go, hmm, yeah, he looks yeah. like he's got a high sperm count. <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's very true i mean the other thing that i find really interesting as someone with a disability as well is like a lot of that thought process a lot of disabled men struggle with as well that whole like i'll oh, go find someone else i can't do this i can't do that so then i can see a lot of 
similarities of, of the viewpoint that disabled men take of like, oh, not good enough. This is wrong. I should do this. So that's why I was listening going, I can, I can feel everything that you're saying right now, but it's, it's interesting. And this is why I, I started the pod was there were so many similar similarities to these different scenarios that people go through that people don't realize that oftentimes if there's a disability or someone's got a difference, they come into the equation as well. But I also wanted to ask, obviously, we've spoke a lot about um, opening up the conversation with your, your partner. Is there any advice you would give for a couple going through this of how to keep those communication channels open and, and make sure that because it's traumatic for both parties because both want a kid, one whether it's the male that's struggling with fertility or the female, one is quote unquote the problem for want of a better word. It's it's a it's a tough time for both parties. So how can you better support each other but then also not neglect yourself? I think that's probably the biggest <laughs> biggest challenge. Oh, absolutely. And and I just want to touch upon something before I come on to that. I just want to touch upon something you said and it's so true. And one of the most important things that happened to me during what I was going through, I listened to a podcast uh, from, and, and the guest was a guy called Ben Tansley. Have you heard of him? I haven't, no. So, um, absolute legend. So Ben was a normal young lad, like doing what lads do, like enjoying life. And he was a motorbiker and he had an accident and became paralyzed from his waist down. And so literally like no no hint of fertility stuff like in his story. He already had kids at this point, but his story of mental fortitude and acceptance and resilience and pushing on from a life-changing incident, I heard it on the morning of, it was in lockdown and um, the, our clinic had asked, or asked around if any couples were willing to be interviewed by the BBC for a, a news article about how, COVID had and uh, lockdown had impacted fertility treatment and, and the, all the hold on it. And at this point, this was summer twenty summer twenty twenty. We're kind of two and a half years into since we knew like my diagnosis. Um, three and a half years since we started trying. But to this point, I hadn't mentioned to anyone apart from obviously my wife. She was part of it. <laughs> but um, our two mums knew, and that was it. I hadn't open. I hadn't spoken to anyone, not online or anything. And I listened to that podcast with Ben Tansley in the morning well, and they were coming around about lunchtime. And it was so inspiring that I said to my wife, when the BBC come here, I'm going to tell them. I'm going to open up and say what's going on. And she, and she was like, what? And I did. And wow. it was the first time, as it was the first time I'd spoken, it was a big blurb. I was, I was literally verbally vomiting out my story and my pain. <laughs> and as it happened, um, not a single moment of it made the cut that went out on the news because it was a two and a half piece about lockdown effective fertility treatment. But that was a pivotal moment in, in my life because I heard Ben Tansley's story. And don't get me wrong, if I'd heard that, say, a year before, it may not have had an impact. I heard it at the right time. I was obviously at that point where I yeah. was at the tipping point of acceptance and I, there's this point, you know, the classic griefing of, of acceptance being the last phase. Well, there's points beyond that. There, there's like acceptance plus or something, you know, the sharing, just coming to terms with something is, yeah. is, is great and it's crucial. But actually then pushing beyond it and wanting to share and go back and help people like you are and like Ben is, that is like a superpower. And I was like, it just it pushed me into that. So anyway, <laughs> and it, you know he's a legend. I've spoken to him since. I've messaged him on Insta and just to say how much impact he had on my life, and he, he just to say how important it is because he he was doing that to help other people who had become disabled as a result of tragic accidents. But I was saying you've changed my life, and it's nothing to do with that. So yeah, I just wanted him to know, and he's such a legend. He, I spoke to him a few times, yeah. but um. Yeah, to come back to your question. Um, supporting a partner. So, for example, I, I mentioned how vacant I was being in appointments. It, that was putting a, a massive burden on my wife because she was having to then 
like you know generally throughout what we were going through she was shouldering the burden for me because by this point we we were telling people that we were struggling to conceive but not why so she was essentially shouldering a big question mark people assuming that it was her because that's the assumption that society has that it's a more of a female problem mm-hmm. yeah and then it it was on top of that, going into appointments and having to listen for the both of us and speak for the both of us and then recall it all to me. And it essentially that's a massive psychological burden in what is, of course, like you said, it's a really upsetting time for her as well. So one thing that I started to do for, the, for then mm. is I started taking notes in the appointments and it really brought me present and brought me back into the room. It meant that I was actively listening and it meant that then I was looking down at these things that they're saying. Because like I said, like, you know, you get an introduced all these new words, scientific words, medical words, never heard them before. You know, like when I was diagnosed with azoospermia, one word, never heard it before until I was, oh, how old was I? Was I 20, about 35, never heard it before in my life. Suddenly it's a life-changing word that has defined my life there onwards for one way or another. Um, so looking at these words and asking questions back because that's what it it allows you to do and suddenly that's removed that burden from my wife so um that's something that that partners who perhaps aren't the ones with the diagnosis can do to to, you know whether whichever way it's around um is to do to release uh, relieve some of the burden um and this is something that i stumbled across um and there is a a pun (laughs) there you'll see but it was walking and talking was massive um because before then, when we were trying to talk and my wife would try to initiate conversation and it's like you're looking at each other and it feels like an interview. I found it too daunting. I couldn't open up, but we just started mm. going for a stroll. Mm. And actually, when you're side by side and you, there's so many kind of metaphorical things to it, like it's like you're walking in the same direction, You're but you're out in nature, which helps kind of release stress anyway getting out of nature it's a huge yeah. stress reliever it clears the cortisol in your body and it, it just allowed me to be able to open up and and it, like, again so that's good for the person experiencing all these this pain to start releasing which again helps the partner but then in terms of like in this case my wife she was amazing it supported me by like I said earlier not pushing she tried didn't work learned to take a more softly, softly approach and know when to apply a bit more pressure. That was brilliant. But, and, and like you said, communication is is vital because it's so easy to shut down. I did it. Uh, and essentially what it, what I needed from her was to come to me on my level, sit, come and sit in the mud with me and, and like come in at, mm-hmm. at the same place that I'm at and, and, and she was just she was great at that and and yeah just kind of you're in it together like it's not and and of course and i know this and she said it afterwards but she was desperate to push on like really and especially with women there's the biological clock we can't escape that and she really wanted to push on but yeah. she knew that yeah. that was not going to help the situation and not going to put like help speed me up she she slowed down told me there was no pressure take my time <laughs> but knowing well maybe perhaps not knowing but actually that was what was helping me come along it's interesting you're it's quite nice as well for someone else to quote simon Sinek without it being me um but it's it's so true i think having good it's what i always say on here is every problem if you trace it all the way back it always comes back to poor communication mm. and yeah, I'm yet to be proven wrong of like communication is the king of any problem because I think particularly we've touched on like sometimes men's approach just like oh I can manage this on my own but as soon as you open the door of the conversation the whole thing changes because mm. it becomes a lot easier because you share the weight and I think that's the biggest thing is is people realizing that as I say particularly with the infertility that is such a that's such a team game it is like it, it doesn't tend to work when there's one of you obviously as you say there are exceptions but it's it's so important to keep those channels open but i think there's a huge part that play it plays in met the way 
men work in society with, when it comes to fertility, do you think that is having a negative impact in us talking about fertility? Because there is this whole st- stiff upper lip approach of we're going to be fine, we'll just push through. Oh, yes. Um, it's, a, it's a massive problem for men in every aspect. Um, like We've made some, some massive leaps with mental health like, and it helps when you're getting influential people and celebrities talking about it, and that's what really helps to destigmatize things. But there are so many things that we're really lacking in, and when there's still not really anyone talking about infertility, and or often if they do, it's a bit like what I said. Like it's almost, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, it's private information, but often it's shrouded as couple infertility. Oh, they went through it, and. I truly believe that more often than not, when when it's like that, it's probably to do with the man because it's the fifty fifty. So as I mentioned, the World Health Organization said their latest research from I think it's last year, one in six people worldwide will go through this, and it the split is fifty fifty, male and female, because people just society tells us that's not that's not the case that men because you see people like Mick Jagger having babies when they're OAPs and. That is not representative and more often than not these old <laughs> celebrity dads have got young female partners who are a lot more capable of like for example their eggs repairing poor sperm quality and etc but yeah we, we've got a long way to go we've come a long way the, the stigma is still there for infertility there's still very few men worldwide talking about it the ones that are I know them I've got all their numbers because it's such a small community but it is changing. Um, there is light kind of at the end of the tunnel, but how far away that is, we still can't tell the distance, but it's there. Um, and and yeah. the, the message that I, I put out is key, is that this didn't happen to me. It happened for me. I have become 100% a better person, a better man than I ever would have been if I hadn't been through this. I, I'm a better father than what I would have been had I just knocked up my missus easily first time. I'm, I'm a stronger version, a more resilient version of myself. Like I'm even now. So that was like the first challenge that I and we encountered. I'm going through some tremendous struggles at the moment. And fuck it, why not? Here, um, here's some exclusives. I haven't even talked about this on my own channels or anything. But so my my, my son is like. Um, He's autistic, non-verbal. He has epilepsy. So that's the daily struggle. He's three and a half. It's very cruel to see him going through that. Uh, my mum has been diagnosed with motor neurons disease, which is like in, like incredibly tough. Uh, and uh, a couple of months ago, where are we now? Three months ago, my dad took his own life. So it's like, come on, what else have you got? <laughs> wow. Uh, that is that is intense. That is extremely intense. Wow. Uh, yeah, I don't really know what. To, so that is that is yeah a lot to go through. And then I suppose has there been an element of like Jesus Christ, you've really pla- like you, you you've really lined them up for me. Mm. Why is there so many? Is has that been a thought that's gone through your head? Yeah, and my wife said it as well. Like after my dad died um, in July, she was like, "Oh come on, give us a break. This is a joke now. Like, how much are we?" Uh, like are we supposed to put up with and we used to say when we were going through the infertility the reason we were being dealt this hand is because we were strong enough as a couple to deal with it we could look not even far in our friendship group like and realize and look at couples who we knew it would break and it sadly does happen to many couples it does um, lead to some very sad breakups but now then the other thing happens, like, first of all, with my son, it became started becoming apparent. And then my mum was second with her diagnosis after some things started happening and, and kind of, it was starting in her dominant arm and hand, uh, like not, like, kind of, you know, like, kind of not working as well and feeling tingling. And then she got diagnosed and then my mum and dad weren't together um, anymore. They got divorced like 30 years ago and he didn't know actually if I'm, what my mum's going through. But then that happened and it's like, right, okay, this is a bit of a joke now. Um, but, and uh, you know, I'm almost sounding maybe a bit blasé about it. But the thing is, obviously, like this is the day-to-day struggle that we're dealing with and that we we are resilient enough to deal with. Um, but it's like I said to my wife, even in the days after my dad died, I said to her, 
like, you know, I was raw, like really upset. But I said, I am ultimately, I am still happy. I'm still happy with my life. I'm so grateful for so much that I've got. And that is a point I got to through the infertility because I started and this, oh, the, the Americans have kind of ruined this phrase, but I started practicing gratitude every day. I started listing every single day things that I was grateful for. Mm. And it, it had a profound impact on my mental health, my outlook in life. And even though I'm not actively writing stuff down every day, I think about it all the time of what I just have to look around. What am I grateful for today? And like I used to call it practicing extreme gratitude because I would, I would say every day it had to be something different because obviously at first you go for the easy, like uh, uh, materialistic things. You go, I'm grateful for my car, grateful for my house, blah, blah, blah. And then, no, that's gone. You run out onto the next one. Mm -hmm. And then it's things like I'm grateful to to be able to walk to my kitchen, to be able to walk to my kitchen. You no, know, that's, a, that, that's a, a gift to be able to... Um, turn on the tap and have drinking water like that is a gift and yeah. things like that and when you really start turning your your mind to all the things that are to be happy for is when you get the extreme challenges like i defy it I, i'd love to play top trumps of life's shit hands with someone because i think i could probably give anyone a good run for their money but i tell you what <laughs> i still feel pretty happy at the end of all of it i suppose the biggest thing because what started you on this journey has led to you to what you're doing now with knackered, na uh, knackered, knackers. God, that's really hard to get. Sometimes <laughs> it's really hard to tie your tongue around. Um, yeah, it's led you to what you're doing today. So I like, uh, not in the same context as yours, but I always say like people say to me, cause I was uh, practically born disabled and everyone goes, oh, like would you hand your disability back? And they get really taken aback when I go, no, cause I'd probably be a boring old fucker, the same as everyone else. And like, and I'd probably not be doing half of the things that I'm doing now. And I think those are the things that people don't realize is sometimes the things that people see as challenges. Yes, they are in the time when you're going through them. But once you get to, like you said, the level of acceptance, you go, do you know what? I wouldn't have done half the stuff I've done now if I, this hadn't happened to me. So maybe it's for for, yeah, for a reason i could not agree more and it's it's like i said it hasn't happened to me it happened for me and it's i thought you, you mentioned things words earlier like it, i i found that neuro linguistic programming helped a lot it, changing the can't to the cans the shouldn'ts or or, or couldn'ts to the coulds and shoulds and etc and oh i oh, i really i really have to go to the gym no i don't have to i get to what a fucking privilege things like that and that's what starts to yeah. change the frame on yeah. on on life when you realize that it, things aren't happening as a detriment they're all just making they're leveling us up like you, you just hit hit new levels of, of self-worth for example something that got extremely attacked on my behalf and, and having to realize who i was as a man and how often you know do we as does anyone sit down and go who am i but that's what something like this really mm. really makes you do and like you said like, i wouldn't change what's happened to me i wouldn't change a single thing absolutely not because every time it's a new version of myself that's coming out and i like who i'm becoming I completely, completely agree to that. Coming back to some of the amazing work that you do, what advice, like, what support is actually out there for men dealing with infertility? Because as you say, it's not often something that's spoken about. It's it's not something that people are aware of. So what support is out there? And also, how can uh, people get tested to find out? Because I'll be honest, until I started doing research into yourself, I didn't even think that we could get tested. It wasn't even a thing that I was like thinking about or considering um so yeah what what is out there hmm. so thankfully now on the support side of things there are, there are a lot more uh, things about now um than, than what there was you know, just uh where are we seven or eight years ago when i was going through um obviously there's so i, I just started sharing my story because i was like I, that's I, I thought if i could help one bloke job done and i did it it we went further than I ever could have imagined. And I said, 
then I was like, right, what next? What what? And and sharing my story was really powerful. And but when you're sharing something retrospectively up to the present, and, and that that story has happened. So I was like, so what do I do now? How can I help people now and push on from here? Because I couldn't just keep regurgitating the same old stories. And so that's when I trained to be a coach to actually help men mm. progress. And and I liked the discipline and, and and the training of coaching because there's a lot of connotations which are really quite um attractive to men of like that coaching like performance progression like the sports analogies that come with it rather than and again i say this from experience coaching or therapy sorry counseling or therapy like that, that they're, they're stigmatized as well and i would say that's silly because when I eventually did engage with the in-house counsellor at the fertility clinic it, it pushed me on immensely but I wouldn't do it for ages because of the stigma but that's what again something that attracted me to coaching because of the kind of the forward thinking nature of it and about becoming new newer better leveraging things and growing so that's from like my personal perspective there's other there's online support groups out there there's there's just men talking about it They're, all you have to do is find one person and you, you'll follow the wormhole and you'll find the others like, like i said not many but it is happening just this weekend gone and this is I, <laughs> this is not a shameless plug I, I i i promise but this weekend gone on the saturday uh, the independent did a um article on male infertility and on sunday sky news did um and and myself and my podcast uh, co-hosts were in both we were interviewed for them um but that is so crucial and the crucial thing about that is the mainstream media is outside of the fertility echo chamber that gets into the laps of men who necessarily wouldn't have been looking for it who are just scrolling through sky news and they see this and they're like oh that's what i'm going through does someone else is going through it so that's what's important and that's what's out there now yeah and and I, I promise I'm not doing this, but um, another thing that we featured in earlier in the year, we were in Men's Health magazine, and that article was all based on, and this comes on to your second point, was about testing. And there is now, and again, this wasn't around yeah. when I was going through it, when I needed to, to go for a, a sperm analysis, you have two options. You either go into a clinic, which is, horribly sterile and unsexy and i've had occasions where i haven't even managed to do it because of the pressure and you think you know for a bloke just to be like oh yeah. Yeah, i just need to go and have a quick tug and then not being able to do it it's it's not like on the film um yeah yeah ro uh was it road trip where it's all banter and all that no it's not like that when you've got potentially life-changing repercussions on the other side um, and having to go and hand an empty pot back to the yeah. receptionist is, is quite galling to say the least. Um, but now, and to come back to, to why it was in men's health, there is a massive upsurge in, um, in at home testing. So, uh, technology's moved on. We can now do it at home because again, uh, there, that was an option before of doing it at home, but then you had to get it to a clinic. I think it was within an hour. And you had to keep it at like body temperature. So often female partners would like keep it in, in their bra or put it, people put it between their thighs or in their armpit. But I never had that option because of where yeah. I lived, there were no fertility clinics and I would have been chancing it too much to try and get to one within an hour. But now you can do it at home and use your phone, use literally a smartphone to analyze it using the technology of these providers. And there's a few about and like Xseed and Jack, uh, for example, or two, you get sent to your home and, and it takes away a lot of that pressure of being in that clinical environment, um, thinking that nurses are talking about you or timing you. Uh, and, and I can assure you now knowing nurses in the industry uh, and having met many of them at conferences, etc., that is not the case. They are the most empathetic caring people and they are there to support you but so if you do find yourself which you will because you cannot replace clinical grade testing let's get that straight that the home tests are a good starting point and to give you a, a good uh idea of where yeah. you're at but you you cannot replace clinical grade testing so you will end up there if you need 
if you're in this situation. And I think it's really important to to acknowledge and to reassure guys that you're not being judged in any way. I can wholeheartedly tell you that. And I've been there. I've been in that situation where that's all you can think about. But yeah, they they are just they are there to help you. <laughs> not literally like road trip, but they are there to to facilitate you along the way and, and just um they're really they're great. Yeah. What um how long does it take to get an analysis? Well, if you got it done at clinic, how long does it take to get the results? Um results I think typically come they say two weeks, I think. The, and the problem is with this, I haven't done one since ooh, it would have been about twenty nineteen. So that's pre COVID. It depends whether you're private or, or NHS. Five years. Um yeah. so yeah, I do have to heavily caveat that that I'm from memory for me i think it was about a two week turnaround but often it was earlier when it was um when we ended up in a private clinic it was within an hour or two uh, because they were literally taking it and and analyzing straight away whereas if it's lhs or a kind of um outsourced clinic then yeah it can be a bit longer but um i'd say yeah definitely ask the questions and, and that's the thing as well Another tip is that you just have to be your own advocate. You really have to ask all the questions. You have to be the squeaky wheel because you'll get oiled. Um, that's the approach we took. But yeah, ask questions. Like how long should it be till I uh, can get this? So yeah, inexperience is anywhere from a few hours to a couple of weeks. And uh, I, I remember when doing research, your co-host Kieran mentioned that diet, exercise and a lot of life factors can actually have a huge impact on sperm count. Um, mm. what of obviously you work more directly in the space with Kieran what have you seen with that and how much impact does it have mm. yes it's massive so in my case um, I had no sperm from the outset uh, and it never changed there was never any found yep. but what I would say is what helped me massively mentally was I overhauled my diet my lifestyle I cut booze I've never smoked but I, I cut alcohol out and we, we spoke just before we hit record about the, the bizarre nature of our British society that when you decide to cut out literally what is a drug, we are deemed to be the weirdos. But it's like, okay. But the, the part, part of the problem with that is, is that I wasn't telling anyone why I was cutting it out. And it was because of the fertility, but I wasn't talking about that. And yeah. my, I think probably because my reasons were a bit airy-fairy, it led to more people like i had people i literally had a colleague at work christmas do refuse to buy me a non-alcoholic drink and um but because i was like oh just on a bit of a health kick at the moment and i think that is that a bit help. wishy-washy but yeah, that's still a valid reason do you know what i mean but um so yeah i i i gave myself the best chance i could and that helped massively because a lot well virtually all of fertility struggles is out of your control i took into my control what I could. And that was what I was putting into my body, what I was putting into my mind as well. Um, but yeah, the yeah. sperm counts are, especially in the Western world, are have virtually halved in the last 50 years. And a lot of that is because of the change in lifestyle that we have. We have this culture of convenience where we are sat at desks a lot. Our balls, like I mentioned earlier, need to be cooler. But when they're sat wedged in between our thighs all day, getting hotter where we've got laptops on our lap perhaps um saunas great for your health for your, for your circulation and stuff and stress but not good for your, your sperm health hot tubs hot baths really not good if you're having them regularly diet as well hugely like again this culture of convenience you're hungry or you're hangry even worse um and you go into the supermarket or like a tesco metro mm -hmm. or whatever all of the easy convenient food that's by the tills it's exactly what you don't want to be eating it's full of sugar full of salt processed in these shiny packets meal deals like attractive to buy and not good for your sperm and for the majority of men so azeospermia i think one percent of men have that general poor sperm health low mm -hmm. counts low motility low morphology there's many more men in that situation and and like in Kieran's case, it can be reversed. All of these lifestyle things, smoking and alcohol, huge, like massive for, for sperm health um, or sperm poor health, I should say. You can cut that out and you'll be like, amazed at how quickly the results can change. Kieran, he was diagnosed, he, he was tested there and he only had, so that 
and like I said, most men, like kind of with a normal sperm count, have tens of millions of sperm in each time they ejaculate. Kieran had 1,500, and I often do remind him that's 1,500 more than I had, but he, um, by trade, is, is a PE <laughs> teacher, and he, but he had all of his yep. personal training accreditations as like bolted on as well. He used his knowledge of, of his trade yeah. and then but also he is he's, he's remarkable with research. He often does a lot of the research for our podcasts and I just uh I'm like, yeah, outsource it to him. But he, he just loves reading and he just he read actual like medical papers, like dry as anything. But he would read papers and papers and papers of research. Mm-hmm. And he, he devised his own his own program, diet, nutrition, and he got his sperm count from that 1,500 up to 4 million aren't by himself. That's impressed. That is quite, that's quite impressive. Yeah. It's it's amazing how much that has an impact. Is there any, I, was, I don't know if you know, but are there any like foods that or, or things that you should be doing that you should definitely lean towards? Obviously exercise plays a massive part, but I'm thinking, is there, should you be eating higher protein? Should you be not eating as much red meat? What's, what's the, what does the data that you've seen say? So, I, I'm going to heavily caveat this with this isn't my area of expertise and, and seek the um, advice of a professional nutritionist or dietitian. Um, we had one on our podcast, not trying to divert people away, but like that hour of, of what she was saying. was, it was That's right. Like, you can do that. <laughs> You're here to, you can promote your podcast. It's, um, well, I may as well at this point, but yeah, the male fertility podcast, but series three, I think it was of episode two, sorry, episode two of series I've gone mad. Episode three of series two was Mel Brown. She's like one of the leading nutritionists in in the fertility field in in the country. Um, So generally, and and it's like what what came up in that chat was the cliches are true. Like eat the rainbow. It's a cliche, but it's true. Get as much nutrient and fiber into your body as you can. Mm. Good stuff, organic stuff if possible. We do acknowledge that it's expensive. Um, but that can be done like Audi have, for example, Audi have organic ranges now. Um, think about microplastics. Like yeah. if things are in plastic packaging, it's typically fine, but don't go heating it up in there like Tupperware. Big no, no. Don't heat it up in a microwave, transfer it to ceramic or glass. Um, yeah, just a, a well-balanced whole food based diet. It is great. Get some nuts and seeds in your diet because they're great for antioxidants, um, oxid- oxidative stress. I can never say that word, but that, that has a huge impact on on sperm health, um, the pollution in the environment, stuff like that. Just like water, be like, be mindful of where you, what your water's like in your area where you live and stuff. And like, that's made the news a lot recently. But they're all what what we're doing every day has a massive impact, and and generally. What is good? A good diet for sperm health, for fertility, is just a good diet in general. There's an, and that's the beauty of it. It's it's not overly complicated. We tend to try and overcomplicate things, and and yeah. perhaps uh, certain people, influencers, professionals, whatever, might be trying to do that. But for some reasons, and so, so you go to them. But generally, it's it's easy. You know what we should and shouldn't be eating. We know what. Because generally that stuff's nice, and I say that as an absolute chocolate fiend. <laughs> I know it's, I shouldn't be doing it, but it's just all about moderation, and that's the best thing that Mel said as well. Is she will never dictate that you have to give things up cold turkeys, otherwise we, we just bounce back and, um, and and fall off the wagon. It's about moderation and getting through what's a miserable time in in the best way you can. Definitely. And I think, I mean, I've said it before, having spent a lot of time in sort of the fitness world, is that people, I, you're completely right, Fit uh, people overcomplicate diet so much and it's like, oh, this is a superfood. Oh, this is the devil food. Just just balance it out. It, too much of one thing is just a bad idea is the way, the sort of general rule of thumb I give to friends. Um, lastly, before I hit you with the last question, um, what 
just to finish up, what advice would you give to a male suck suffering with fertility difficulties? Like, what would you say is sort of the first step, or maybe they they found out that they know their their count's low? What would you, what advice would you give? Two things, like two parallel things. Firstly, early intervention, early appointments, like with professionals, and at the same time, early support, because both of those will, will stand you in good stead and will fast forward you through it. Um, don't bury your head in the sand at any point, not either one of those, because they're, they're, they'll both be so detrimental. One of them to your actual chances of, of hopefully turning things around. And you know that, uh, like me, for some people, that's never going to happen. But you, you'll navigate the process quicker. Yeah. And if you've got support on your side and you're reaching out and you're speaking to others that are, have been or are in the same boat, that will expedite you mentally and uh, emotionally through it because it's tough. Um, and what I would say as well, and here, another one, but because this, again, I, I didn't tell anyone. And when I did tell my mates, they they were brilliant. None of them have experienced it. And that's why I wasn't telling them because of the assumption that people just won't get it, won't understand. And, and we do become harmed because some people will come out with the crappy like uh, anecdotal comments of like, comments. oh, just relax. Like anything, don't ever say anything to someone that begins with just, because it's likely that what you're about to say on the other side of it is is not going to be good for them. Oh, just go on holiday, relax, just do this. But but yeah, give give your friends a chance because by not telling them, you're robbing them of the opportunity to help you and to show you like they are friends and good friends and that's why they're in, in your life. So just, you never know. You haven't got anything to lose. If they come out and, and are complete dog shit and say the wrong things, then you're not losing anything. You're you're, you're going to cut them out of your life and they don't deserve to be there. And, and they weren't a friend that deserved to be there anyway. So you, you just open up the space to gain a good supportive friend. 100%. The other thing I'd add as a general rule when it comes to anyone struggling with fertility is can we, pl- and you said it earlier, can you, can we please move away from the fact of like, oh, when are you going to pop a sprog out? When are you going to have kids? When- can we just knock that on the head? Cause people don't realize that everyone, everyone struggles, male, female, doesn't matter who. It, people will have kids in their own time. You don't know what's going on behind closed doors. And I say that quite passionately because a lot of my friends and family are going through it at the moment. Just please stop. It's not yeah. worth it. it. Like You wouldn't like the same said to you, but I just thought I'd add on to the end there because you touched on it, but I don't think we talk about it enough of the amount of pressure that comes with that and how mm. that can make someone feel as well, especially oh, if yeah. you don't know that they're going through fertility difficulties massive it can be a massive blow for their mental health as well um yeah sorry that was a bit of a random thing to tackle the end but i really wanted to to highlight it and i'm sure oh, no, it's a, you feel yeah. something similar oh it's important it's, it's like i said that question was annoying us before we even knew that we had a fertility problem and then when you when you know you've got it and you're still getting asked that question it flipping stings so you can always tell people that have Mm. I've known someone very closely or, or been through it themselves because they never asked that question. And to add on to that, if someone's got yeah. one child, never ask when they're going to have a second because secondary infertility is massive. But you don't know what they might have gone through to get that one child. And it's because our society, unfortunately, yeah. glorifies reproduction and puts a lot of weight onto your ability to, to or to not because you're deemed as a bit of a, an outcast if, if you don't have children, which is so wrong. Which is even stranger now, particularly because we're seeing the increase of people actually choosing not to have children. It's mad that it's such a big thing, but I think it's because it's so, um, what's the word? Like it's so ancestral of like, this is what we do as a species that we must do and while there is an element of like we have to recreate to keep keep the population going i think the world's going to be good for a little while if people don't want to have kids um and then just to finish off i ask every guest this question at the end of every episode which is what's one piece of politically correctness that you really strongly agree with or disagree with it's gonna have to be something around male some masculinity but it, yeah it's just that we're all deemed to be strong and that we put up and shut up and it's it's just absolute bullshit. It's 
you're not it's not wrong to admit that you're struggling and that you need help like that's what you know political correctness will tell you is that we should just be the strong silent ones and I can tell you now no remarkable man in history has ever got there by being by putting up and shutting up 100% 100% I mean I lean on my partner uh, all the time and I think there's something to be said for the strongest people will tend to be with the strong have the strongest circle around them not the strongest individual absolutely we're social beings you know and like uh, yeah it's, um, there's power in, in that there's power in community and power in, in, in relationships and bonds and, and that's for me that's the, the beauty of life is humans and, and how we come together and, and actually from my own experience how DNA is completely irrelevant for that it doesn't it is not a precursor for, for, for bonds like especially when it comes to children I defy anyone to tell me they love their children more than I love mine because it ain't possible. Just ain't possible. It's, a, it's interesting because every, every parent says that, but then I it, I would caveat that with we only know what we know. You're mm. going to always love your child more than you love any other child. Yeah. Whether that's your child by birth or whether that's your child by family situation is always going to be they're the most important thing for you and the reason i say that is because the work i do outside of all this wonderful podcasting and disability stuff i work with lots of different children and one of the best pieces of advice a team member gave me once is you have to remember that um a a parent phones you and they are talking about the most important person to them we are dealing with x amount of important people they are all mm. as important as each other but we won't never understand how important they are to the mum the dad whatever it might be it was a massive it was one of those moments you go that made complete sense and i don't even think she planned for it to but it was something that i've always remembered is uh, a parent's connection to its child is completely different to anything else i love that yeah, so true. Obviously, as with any, as with anything, there is a ca- there is caveats to it. There's differences and everything else. But as a general rule of thumb, it's it's such a powerful thing. Yeah, absolutely. But I am just going to say thank you so much for coming on. I think it's always tricky when we deal with these more intimate conversations because people don't realise as well how how much power it takes to to give this information out and take on the sort of mantle as you said of of you wanting to spread the the word of the struggles that you've gone through and then help others with it so i'm sure you've been told it before but thank you for what you're doing and thank you for being so open and so honest of course as we always do we'll link all of sean's stuff below his pod everything all of his details below so if you don't want to reach out to him or speak to him um We'll link it all below. But thank you so much for coming on, Sean. Oh, it's, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for everything you're doing uh, and for raising awareness of, of male infertility as well. Because it's, um, yeah, it's, like I said, it's getting out of that, that echo chamber, which you are playing your part in. And I, I, I thank you for that. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Not Quite Podcast. Please make sure you follow us on TikTok and Instagram to get regular updates about the podcast. These bad dads, they get hurt.